by the Heinz College and the Center for International Relations and Politics, directed by Professor Kyron Skinner, and also where I work as a research associate. Before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge a few people who helped bring this presentation to you guys. Uh, Dean Ramaya Krishnan, Associate Dean Brenda Pizer, Jackie Speedy, and Amanda Kenner were all extremely helpful and supportive in coordinating this event. Today's speaker is Mr. Alonzo Fulgham, who is Chief Operating Officer at USAID. USAID is an independent government agency with a twofold mission to help expand American interests abroad in the form of promoting democracy and the free market and also to improve the lives of citizens across the globe. Frequently, these two goals go hand in hand as USAID addresses the underlying lack of opportunity that is the fundamental cause of poverty and violence in the world today. Along with diplomacy and defense, development is a key part of our nation's national security strategy. In order to fulfill its mission, USAID works with a number of organizations to provide support for economic growth, agriculture, global health initiatives, conflict prevention, and humanitarian assistance in approximately 100 developing countries per year to year. These organizations come in many forms, from companies and international nonprofits to indigenous groups and faith-based organizations. Through contracts and grants, USAID, USAID has partnered with over 3,500 companies and more than 300 private voluntary organizations. Today's speaker, Mr. Fulgham, began his career at USAID in 1989 at Swaziland as a private sector advisor. Since then, he served all over the globe in South Asia, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. In, uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan, he served as the former director of economic restructuring and energy. And there he was responsible for coordinating USAID's efforts to help Georgia create the legal infrastructure that would foster economic growth and openness for in international businesses. Since 1997, when USAID appeared in, uh, first came to Georgia, Georgia's GDP has increased consistently until recent tussle with Russia and some political developments to real things. Um, from 2005 to 2006, Mr. Fulgham served in Afghanistan as mission director, and for his work there, he received a Presidential Meritorious Rank Award. In the early days of the Obama administration, he served as the acting administrator of USAID, and in that role was one of the principal architects of the State Department's Quadrennial Di Diplomacy and Development Review. Currently, he serves as Chief Operating Officer and Executive Secretary at USAID. And in this role, he is responsible for ensuring USAID's formation and implementation of its policies and strategic planning agenda. He's also responsible for ensuring its management and program reforms. And for his work in this role, he's received USAID's Superior Achievement Award. Throughout his career, Mr. Fulton has learned that the key to development is starting at the ground level. Ownership is a key principle at USAID because when you begin development by building on the leadership and commitment of people within their own communities, you can better ensure the success of international policies. For those of us interested in a similar career in international development, Mr. Fulton has a few words of advice. Number one, nothing replaces work experience and passion. And two, study hard, because there are no easy solutions left. So here to talk to us about our role in economic development and international policy, please welcome Mr. Alonzo Ford. Very well done. Very, very well done. Very well done. <laughs> Nagisade, thank you very, very much. Good afternoon, CM. Good afternoon, CM. Back row, I can't hear you. You guys sleeping back there? My friends, um, this is a woman who studied the effects of physician communications on reducing prescription costs. She analyzed data sets on teen mother and infant uh, interaction. She's been on the ground in Mississippi right after Katrina, and she's won the best speaker at Toastmasters, not once, not twice, but three times. <laughs> so I, I hate to 
I hate to break the bad news to you, but I think it's she you should really be listening to today and not me. Um, first, I wanted to take care of a personal uh, issue. I wanted a personal thought, excuse me. Uh, first of all, Dr. Skinner, I want to thank you uh, for hosting me. Uh, and I want to tell you that I'm proud to have learned over the last few months of your father's lifetime of teaching, scholarship, and public service. While I didn't have the honor of knowing Dr. Byron Skinner, I know that his intelligence, his voice, and his courage carry on in you. I also understand that even in his final years of life, he maintained his library of 4,000 volumes with such military precision that he could find any one of them instantly. I could imagine that in an early age, that would teach anyone to return them right away, right? <laughs> Anyways, CM is very lucky to have you. Now to you guys, why I'm here today. I'm delighted to join you all in this lecture series. I understand our charter here is to consider issues of historical and cultural and social and economic of contemporary importance. So today, my purpose is suitable, audacious, suitably audacious. Within 20 minutes, I simply plan to convince you of your role, your direct, indispensable role, and the future of global economic development and American national security policy. You all look ready to me, a little bit. So let's start with a few of the facts that Tom Friedman asked us to face in his book a few years ago. And I know most of you have read it, hot, flat, and crowded. Roughly one out of four human beings on Earth, 1.6 billion people, have no electricity. But they all want it, and they all burn whatever they have to. They will burn whatever they have to to get it. One new species is now lost from the face of the planet every 22 seconds. In 2007, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, projected that all of the ice in the Arctic will be melted in summer by 2050. Over the last 18 months, those projections have accelerated from 2050 to 2012. And for you non-math majors, that would be two years from now. But hot, flat, and crowded doesn't begin to capture where we're headed. Consider what humanity has to deal with right now. We're also got to contend with the unfed, the flooded out, the persecuted by regimes that are inept, corrupt, and absolutely brutal. No doubt all have heard about the flooding in Pakistan, which covered one-fifth of the country and affected 20 million people. Among those people were young men, literally washed up, who are now all more prone to join insurgents. Question to all of you, should that matter? Does that sound like a matter of American national security in an age when a dirty bomb can be parked in a car or packed in a suitcase? I'd say yes. No, there are cynics out there, generally older, but certainly not wiser, who believe that this generation mistakes posture for action. They say that the millennials confuse Facebook clicks, signing up for causes, and going off on blogs and web postings with meaningful, consequential engagement with the troubles of this world. You know, they even have a word for it, and I've learned this it came from the left coast out in California at Stanford. They call it slacker activism, better known as slacktiz sl slacktism. Slacktism, do you know, do you buy that? You know what slacktism is? Basically, slacker activism. Do any of you all buy that about your generation? You do? You buy it? Okay. <laughs> but I don't. I truly believe that awareness informs action. I believe that yours is the most informed generation this world has ever seen. And I know that your generation has a bias toward action because I've seen it personally in the field where I've worked. So today, I would have you set yourselves an audacious professional goal, a goal you can take very personally. You know what they say in business? It's just business. Well, those of us who work in development 
see our work a little differently. It's personal, it's deeply personal. I've traveled to well over 50 countries in my career. I've lived in six and can say unequivocally that I'm living the American dream. Because along the way I learned that my self-interest was most gratifying served by working in the national interest. I found my place, my role in America by focusing on America's role in the world. Early in my career, I had a life-changing tour in Haiti, which many of you know about, with the Peace Corps. I learned from people trying to get by on one or two dollars a day, people suffering with disease unknown in our country, but all too well known in theirs. People who through no fault of their own lived under despotic regimes with no intention of allowing them a better life. So I simply committed myself to doing something about it, whatever I could, using any tools within my reach, which eventually turned out to include the full faith and confidence and credit of our United States government. Which you all, which you all will be glad to know after Haiti's devastating earthquake of eight months ago has helped build 12,000 transitional shelters, helped to ensure that there have been no significant outbreaks of disease a modern day miracle at this point, and going forward with help to raise agricultural productivity, improve infrastructure, sustain basic services, and support good governance and security. Because you are here today at a wonderful place like Carnegie Mellon, I already know that you're smart enough and capable enough to take on the immensely complex and interrelated problems we face with climate change, energy, food security, water, health, education, science and technology, governance, and I think most importantly, economic growth. I also know that everyone in this room is also smart enough to read between the lines and see the connections and what you might think of as the development matrix, the incredibly intricate and interdependent array of variables that directly determine the well-being of mankind. There is no abstraction, it's not a theory, it's a living reality. This morning, more than a billion people out of one out of every three people on Earth began their day undernourished, which causes fully a third of preventable deaths in women and children. More than any other disease, this, my friends, is the leading killer of children, causing more than 3.5 million, that's 3.5 million deaths each year. Since, mid since the mid-1990s, these numbers have grown. Are you okay with that? Are you? Are you okay with that? I don't think so. Spiking food prices, recession, natural disasters, they all stoke the problem. And, our, and, our present path, and on our present path, it will get far worse. The World Health Organization currently forecasts a 68% increase in undernourished children in Africa by 2020. That's just 10 years from now. Now, any solution, any solution must be as comprehensive as the problem is complex. Spanning the entire range of agriculture from research to production to storage to consumption. A comprehensive approach that pays special attention to small farmers and those most vulnerable to setbacks as a result of crop failure price spikes, or forces out of their control. Late last year, President Obama committed, in partnership with the G8 Summit, heads of states, government, and international regional organizations to a joint commitment of $20 billion for food security over the next three years. And here's why. By 2050, according to the FAO, global food supplies, and this is by 2050, must increase by an estimated 70%. That's 70%, my friends, to meet expected demand from a growing world population. That's only 40 years from now, when most of you will be in your prime. Doing justice to the problem and justifying that $20 billion investment means coordination, unprecedented coordination between all the agencies, NGOs, and private sector actors working this problem. To do otherwise will invite calamity. 
And I say that again, and remember you heard that here today. To do otherwise is to invite calamity. We have to apply the best creativity, policy practices, and technology we can possibly summon. And to do that, we need more smart people in the game. And that's people like you, actively involved. Are you starting to sense a theme here in what I'm saying today? Now, consider nearly 300 million people's lives are already disrupted each year by climate change and induced events. Right now, this makes climate change more than an environmental problem about saving polar bears. And I know there's some, probably some WWW people here, but I love polar bears, okay? So they're okay with me. <laughs> we seem to forget that climate change is a human problem with direct implications for hunger, poverty, conflict, water scarcity, infrastructure, sanitation, and disease, and human survival. In a world where global temperatures have been increasing since about 1850, climate change has already been responsible for 5.5 million disability-adjusted life years lost in the last decade. On our present path, agricultural yields, yields are expected to drop by as much as 50%. That's by half by 2020 in some African countries, due in part to climate change. Interventions are needed now to stem the tide. Much of the one-sixth of the world's population that now relies on glacial-fed water catchments will face critical water shortages because glaciers are already shrinking at an average rate of 7% a year. Rising temperatures inhibit formation of snowpacks. Those receding glaciers don't release enough water during spring, and summer melts essential to agriculture production. You know where this is going. This could affect the lives up to a billion people. That's a billion with a B. 1,000 million lives breathing human beings in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. These and a host of other escalating changes in food, water, health conflict, and lives lost don't hinge on a computer model forecast of rising sea levels. They're all very direct, all too real, and entirely too immediate. So we have to change our approach and make it more interlaced, more comprehensive, and better coordinated. But the good news is we know what works. We already know how to support sustainable agricultural practices, drought resistance, and low greenhouse gas emissions. How to, how to deliver intelligent water resource management how to support conflict resolution, democracy and governance programs that stabilize societies under stress. These are things we would do under any circumstance, but climate change seriously escalates their urgency. Here's an example of what I mean by coordination at the highest levels. We've got a joint USAID-NASA initiative to create an Earth observation, monitoring, and visualization system over the Himalayas. The glaciers in the mountain range provide the water supply for more than 1.3 billion people. So in cooperation with the nearby countries, we're developing a system to give us a clear picture of water supply and demand for the region to help people adapt. Did you ever want to work at NASA, any of you, and help save millions of lives at the same time? Then I want your resume immediately after this uh, discussion today because I've got a job for you. On, ground, on the ground in Malawi, thousands of farming households are now more food secure and resilient because of USAID's projects in drought prone and food insecure districts. In El Salvador, we're, draw, we're drawing up water management plans in community, with community leaders, local government, public health educators, law enforcement to set up a regulated exchange. So water users make small payments to invest in the buildings and uh, a building of slope creeks, infiltration wells, and, and hedge grows, which minimizes storm damage and improves water availability and dry periods. These are just a few thousand projects or of immediate value to a community that help, world, to help the world's most vulnerable cope with the prospects of climate change. But we're not done. Oh no, capital from all sources will be needed to double in order to reach the internationally agreed upon goals for water and sanitation. And that includes human capital, my friends. And once again, that means you. 
Now consider the other scenario. What happens if we don't manage water intelligently? Think about that for a minute. If we don't come up with a coherent national strategies for a range of actors, including international donors and financial institutions, NGOs and private sector partners, to finance and coordinate and solve this problem, as sure as I stand here before you today, countries will potentially run out of water before they run out of oil. Wars will be fought over water in the next decade, trust me, if we don't raise the level of our game in water diplomacy and management. And we'll need your help to do that as well. There's that theme again. You know I really could have made this a three-word speech. Do more now. So I'll venture a prediction about your future role in global economic development. Based on the hard experiences of our, or your forebearers, I challenge your generation to take an approach of partnership, not patronage, shared responsibility and accountability. Words backed by deeds, where measures, outcomes, not just inputs, which is important for the way we finance the real long-term economic growth and development, as it is for internal and trans-border security. That's why, as a country, we are fully committed to the Millennium Development Goals, which the President's going to announce today uh, at 4.30 or 4.45, so I hope you'll go and take a look at it, because it's going to be an interesting statement he's going to make about our country and our way forward on the QDDR and the PSD. That's why we know we have a change, and that's why we know that we have to change the game in a very, very big way to meet those goals in the next five years on the Millennium Development Goals. And that's why the compact of the Millennium Challenge Corporation provides funding and technical support when host country meets rigorous criteria on everything from fiscal policy to governance to women's rights and the country produces the plan and leads the way toward achieving it. Self-sufficiency is what we're moving toward. We try and collateralize our assets held in local financial institutions of developing countries. Nearly two billion in private capital has been lent in over 60 countries over the last decade backed by credit guarantees from the Development Credit Authority, which has financial infrastructure and water projects from India, Kenya, to Albania, to the Philippines, where I just returned last weekend. For every dollar committed by the U.S. government, one of these loan guarantees, an average of $30 is made available by the private sector. And the default rate, it's about 1%, which sets a fine example for the American mortgage lender, I might think. Around the world in developing countries, our missions are developing technical assistance and training in microfinance and rule and value chain and housing finance and microfinance insurance, remittances and trade agribusiness help. In Rwanda, a woman who survived the genocidal uh, era started weaving colorful baskets. She got spotted at a trade show in Kigali by a trade hub delegation sponsored by USAID and your tax dollars. She got some technical assistance in a product design, marketing and pricing, and a cheap airline ticket to the New York trade show, where a Macy's buyer spotted her work and offered her a deal. Today, she now has over 3,000 weavers generating about $3,000 in annual sales per weaver. We, once, and another example, excuse me, one of our entrepreneurs in Ghana told us that just moving from paper records to simple accounting software changed everything for her. Instead of counting everything and falling behind, she told us not only can she find out exactly where I am each month, but I can see what's really selling, what are, what's not selling, and who owes me. You better believe that makes a difference in a small business. And yeah, you heard it here first, accountants and bookkeepers can help save the world too. At this point, I, I expect most of you understand the fundamental shift we've made in development in recent years. We're all about trade, not just aid. And as the Secretary of State just recently said over the last few months, we're not just going to do development to do development. We don't spend, we invest, we address the immediate, and we build for the long term. Our purpose around the world is sustainable, self-supporting, long-term, economic growth. 
You've already sensed a shift in our overall foreign policy. I expect, towards, I expect towards exercising soft power instead of simply using hard power. It's about leading by example. There is a clear recognition by some of our key opinion leaders that sound development and policy is inseparable from foreign policy. And there's been a lot of intellectual discussion, I'm sure at this university as well, about the fact rather than to say just spending 12 billion a month in Afghanistan, we'd be smarter to invest uh, a few hundred million or maybe a billion in a, a year in a developing context in a place like Af Afghanistan to go after the fundamental problems that are being derived in that country from, ins from an insurgency perspective. After a long debate, led by the previous Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, and, and Secretary Clinton, who's pushed this over the goal line, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, development is now a part of our national security strategy. It's now an equal partner uh, alongside diplomacy and defense. It has become a strategic, economic, and moral imperative for our country. Generals like David Petraeus, Anthony Zinni, are making arguments for, arguments for us in soft power. Defense Secretary Robert Gates has become an unprecedented partner and advocate. And I want you guys, since you guys Google, I want you to go back and look at every defense secretary for the last 25 years. You, have, you will never find an article where a defense secretary has made a case for soft power, give AID more money. So we are in very, very firm ground right now in regards to soft power and leading uh, from that perspective in this country. The stars, I, I feel, have never been more aligned and they haven't been stronger for aid right now. And there's never been a better time than right now, and I hope that you're with me in regards to understanding how important this is to our national interest. In Afghanistan, to help make future military action less necessary, we're tripling the number of civilians on the ground, including agricultural experts who will help farmers develop new crops to replace opium poppies, education experts who will help make schooling more accessible to girls so they can have a chance at a better future. For girls around the world, since they grow up in, to be women who do most of the work in this world, we're working to make sure they feel safe on their streets. So we partner also with MTV, the world's largest television network, by the way, on programming, online content, and live events to raise awareness about 31 billion in human trafficking about $31 billion a year is earned in, in human trafficking. This is a powerful platform to prevent exploitation and assist victims. Right now, we have private contributions uh, running close to $20 million a year now to support this effort. These programs have reached more than uh, 300 million households in 25 countries. USAID is in the business of trying to move minds. And yet, somehow, probably because of the media loves victim and villain stories, if you rely on news media, you get the impression that the root cause of global instability is ideology, Muslims versus Christians, Arabs versus Jews, secular versus sectarian. But the story we persistently overlook is less dramatic, but no less critical. It's all about demographics. A massive youth bulge of a people aged 15 to 29 years of age is emerging throughout much of the Middle East and Africa. And unstable states like Afghanistan, Iraq, Congo, and Sudan, those under 20 years, of old, 20 years of age represent more than half. That's more than half of the total population. Yet they have little hope of legitimate livelihoods. The result, the aggressive Taliban recruitment in South Asia child and adolescent soldiers recruited to carry conflict within the, and across the sub-Saharan borders, ongoing tensions in Palestine territories, more and more young men find themselves competing for income and in jobless economies. So enormous, the social pressures build, exacerbated and intensifying urban density. Do you want proof? Here's an example. A raid in northern Iraq town of Singir traced 52 young militants based there in Dana, a small impoverished town on the coast of Libya, 44 of whom signed up for suicide missions. So we saw ruthless, ruthless young men in Libya becoming a serious security threat in Iraq. But the brush, the, the, the brush strokes show up even in the larger pictures. Fully 
80% of the civil conflicts that erupt in 1970s, in the 80s, in the 90s, have happened in countries where at least 60% of the population was under the age of 30 years of age, under the age of 30 years old, excuse me. I'll trust anybody under 30, but only if they can work to, to support their well-being. That was a running joke in Georgia as well. Uh, they trusted anybody under 30, anybody over 30 they didn't trust. And this is why your role in global development has direct implications for American national and transformational security. Because most instances of Western military interventions abroad since 1960 have occurred in developing countries where civil conflicts were exacerbated, if not caused, by weak economic development. Let's say that again. Weak economic development. Consider Cuba and Vietnam in the 50s, Laos and Lebanon in the 60s, Cambodia in the 70s, Somalia in the 80s, Sierra Leone and Bosnia in the 90s. In the years following these and other civil conflicts, outside forces were brought in to support local military and provide peacekeeping and help with evacuation or actually serve in combat. So it is time that we consider development assistance in the larger sense as a pivotal element in maintaining global security and as a vital diplomacy, as vital as diplomacy and as defense, as I said earlier. At this point in our history, we must use economic development to usher fragile nations and their struggling youth toward the stability that derives from prosperity, self-sufficiency, and wealth of their own creation. Now, I know that in certain circles, there's a tendency to mistake cynicism for sophistication. But you're here at Carnegie Mellon because you're different and because you believe you can make a difference. I think you would find the people of my agency an excellent company. Last year, we did a, a survey, an employee survey. We analyzed the response data. It showed that our people's real commitment to the mission is at about 92%. These numbers you will not see in any other walk of life. Trust me, not at Gates, not at J.P. Morgan, any other big companies, 92%. You may personally decide to take a number of paths to do more about human hunger, about poverty, about resource scarcity, climate change, political instability, armed conflict, human trafficking, and brutality in all of its forms. And when you do, you'll find yourself surprised and delighted to be in the company of people who are not daunted, people who don't quit, people who don't look the other way. And I'm going to say that again, people who don't look the other way. Where is our next Secretary Gates? Where is our next Condoleezza Rice? Where is our next Hillary Clinton? Our, our next Barack Obama? Are you out there? Can you hear me? We need you. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Now, anecdotally, is a story. I spoke at Harvard about four months ago, and uh, it was a Harvard event with about 200 students, and I thought it was a Harvard event. But as we got to the question and answer period, I kept talking to CM students. So I finally asked Harvard, was I at Harvard or was I at CM? So I know I'm going to get some good questions today, so I'm looking forward to it. All right, who's the Springbok in the class? Okay, go ahead. So, thank you for your, uh, for your presentation on the um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, I know USAID, one of their main projects is agricultural development. When President Obama was here uh, for the uh, 2009, he talked about the importance of the United States doubling uh, our support for agricultural development to around a billion dollars. So I'm, I'm wondering... 3.5 actually, 3.5 billion over the next three years. Okay, so, uh, so given that that's an important goal and that agriculture is a place where low-income countries can have comparative advantage, I wonder if you could say something about the relative impact of agricultural subsidies that uh, 
cannot develop countries uh, run at the rate of about 250 billion dollars a year. And whether that's working against our own goals or our you, you, you could be more spot on. And that's why I said earlier in my talk that all the easy answers are gone. <laughs> that we are going to have to have coordination at the highest levels and lowest levels in these countries. And that's why we're identifying specific countries that we are going to enact these programs in. F countries that we think could be a magnet and be representational of what can actually get done from an agricultural perspective. You heard the statistics. We've got to feed 70% more people by 2050. That's not a long time. And the infrastructure that's going to have to be put in place for that to happen in an organized fashion is just absolutely daunting. And if we don't, you're going to see massive starvation uh, in a lot of these countries. So the sense of urgency could not be greater. But we also have to have more people on the ground to help manage and put, identify the impediments that you're talking about on the trade side to get governments to understand that these subsidies are not helping them, they're hurting them. But also, the bigger countries in Europe, as well as in the US, we've got to figure out policies that allow for these goods and services to be transferred without harming our own farmers, but also giving them an opportunity for economic opportunities within, this, within the sphere of the United States. OK? Yes, Professor. <laughs> What what's the process for implementation? Right now, we're trying to move back to country-led strategies. Uh, and I know that people said, that's a no-brainer. Uh, but if we're, ever, if we're ever, as a nation, going to provide the kind of sustainability that we're talking about in these countries, we've got to get them to take responsibility for their own actions. And so when you look at the countries that we've identified, like Ghana which is a success story in Africa, as far as I'm concerned. They figured out that the way to economic growth is stability and education. They focused on those two things. Mozambique is another country. And so we've identified five or six target countries that we're going to work directly with, implementing the country strategies that have been approved by the countries, and then providing the assistance where we need to, to implement these programs. And we anticipate that that will be a catalyst to get the other countries within those regions on board if they want to get the kind of assistance they need to move their country forward on the agricultural policies. OK, I'm going to be fair. Let me go to the side of the room, then I'll come back to the middle. So I won't be accused of being left. OK. okay. What's the role of genetically modified crops in the U.S.? I'm again. What's the role of genetically modified crops in the U.S. IDs? Um, <laughs> Look, this is an extremely contentious issue. You just think, uh, just think in the news the last couple of days, they're talking about creating genetically modified salmon, which I love. And there are already people saying, oh, we don't know enough about the science. You know, are we going to be injured uh, by this? And then in the meantime, we're saying on the other side of our mouth that all these developing countries should accept our genetically modified food. I, I think that genetically modified food is going to play a major role in trying to feed the 70% increase that we're going to need over the next 40 years. We can't grow it all. You know, you have countries now that are leasing land in developing countries because they see this trend coming. And we can't grow it all. I think the soil, uh, the, the, the weather are going to play a major effect on this. So genetically modified food could play a major role. But we've made a mistake, I think, and it's my personal opinion, as a country, we were developing the science. We didn't bring over some of the key opinion leaders in those countries to be a part of the science so that they could go back and say, hey, this really is a good idea. We can't develop the science and then tell these developing countries who potentially may buy this product, hey, this is good for you. Trust us. It doesn't work that way. And this is where we've got to get more into the coordination uh, and collaboration to a point where it's in everybody's mutual interest. It's just, you just can't dictate this kind of thing. But to answer your question, the short answer is, I think it's going to play a major role. But we've got some work to do in building the relationship that need to be built in order to make it acceptable in the countries that we're going to try to ship this stuff to. Uh, OK, now I said the middle this time. I'll come back, OK? Somebody in the middle had the hand. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned there's five or six countries that you're really focusing on for um, economic development. I'm just curious what those countries are and then what the governments criteria for looking for these key players in the different regions and what were the, the, the criteria are countries that have the infrastructure uh, and the human resources uh, and strategy 
that we believe will be able to move that country from an economic perspective along the economic continuum. They already have the basics in place. What they need now is resources as well as infrastructure and some technical assistance. And so they've already laid that out for us in a way that says specifically that they will be able over the next couple of years to pick this thing up and run with it very, very quickly. Uh, you know, Rwanda, uh, Mozambique, uh, Ghana, uh, and I'm missing one. Um, I think it's Kenya uh, are, the, are, the, are the five. And I, what you will find with those countries is they have the leadership, the human capital, uh, and the infrastructure to begin to implement this strategy in, 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 in the short term, which will lead to long-term gains within those regions. Coming back to this side. Yes, ma'am. Um, you spoke earlier on how this is a really great opportunity for you to get your funding coming in, the ask for a two of them at least. The question she's asking, and I think it's a good one, there's been a real concern about our agency's ability to get its job done because we have contracted out so much of our work. And oh, by the way, the Defense Department just came out a few weeks ago saying we've got to get away from that. We need to take inherent government activities and have inherent government employees manage those, uh, those activities. And I think that's a good thing. The agency as a whole, as I mentioned in our previous discussion, we didn't hire anybody from 1996 to 2001. Anybody that's a management major or understands business, recognizes anybody that's a hire agency, doesn't hire in their agency for five years, they're basically going out of business. So from 2001 forward, we were hiring till 2006, we were hiring at attrition, about 120 to 140 employees, just, just to replace the people who were leaving. We're not talking about strategically, we're just saying replace the people who are leaving. 2007, we signed the largest increase on the support of Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Henrietta Hosman IV, uh, largest OE budget request in the agency's history, which allowed for us to hire 1,000 new employees by 2012. That will allow for us to, to deal with your question of having more people on the ground to help manage these individual contracts that you're talking about and to disperse more money at the local level, which is what our mandate really is. But we got out of the business of doing that because it was get smaller, government's too big, and so we start doing mega contracts. What does that mean? By 2012, I think, and this is my own personal opinion, that because of the fact that we've gotten out of Iraq, we're gonna get out of Afghanistan, there's going to be more of a need for you all to be a part of this process. We're going to probably have to hire another 1,000 employees from 2012 to 2015. Now, the President said in most of his speeches in the last couple of, uh, over the last two years he's been in office, he hasn't said it recently, but he wants to double the foreign assistance budget. You know, getting out of war means more work for us, I think, because on the front side, if we can do more on pre-conflict and post-conflict, we can keep these countries out of war. So, if we go from 15 billion to 20 billion, that's a big escalation for AID. So we gotta have more people, as I said before, who study hard, who understand complex problems, who can reason, and who are willing to live in foreign nations and help implement these programs. So I think the future is bright in regards to decentralizing and doing more at the level that you're talking about, but it's gonna take time. As I said, we didn't hire anybody for almost seven years, and then it took us another three years before we got the money, and now over two, from 2007 to now, we're starting that big increase. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, I gotta go back over here now. Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about health care or medical initiatives. I'll say it's not particularly sustainable. Yeah. 
I, the, the health people, I, they, they get mad at me, but I always call them the holy old subsidiary of USAID because they are phenomenal. They have the brightest people in the agency as far as I'm concerned, and they also have the most money, uh, by the way. Uh, that is probably our most successful program, uh, what we do in health, uh, and we're all very, very proud of that. Uh, the president uh, in this administration has decided that we need to do even more. You know, you've heard about HIV AIDS, you've heard about our Malaria No More program, uh, in those areas, if there's a new seven-year, $63 billion program in global health initiatives. And what the president wants to do is move away from just the traditional diseases that we're currently addressing, but also start to address some of the tropical diseases that we can eradicate. He wants to move toward eradicating some of these things. So uh, our health program is second to none, and I think we're doing some great work, and, uh, and we're going to continue to do a lot of work on HIV AIDS program. I know the HIV AIDS, HIV AIDS activists are not very happy about the numbers, but I've seen the, the pipelines and those programs and, and they're pretty substantial. So I, I think the horizon, if you're a health person interested in working in that area, the, the, the future is very strong. Okay. Yes, sir. I've got two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, how do you see the Hold that, I'm not that smart, I'll do one question at a time, so I won't lose it, all right? Mm -hmm. Multilateral institutions, uh, this administration came in saying that they wanted to do more in that area. If we are going to grow our assistance budget, which I think is, has to grow as we move out of some of these countries that are in conflict or potentially going into conflict, we're going to have to use multilateral institutions as an instrument. We just can't manage all this money by ourselves. But I also think it makes good policy because the more coordination you have, the more you can co-opt and integrate uh, leverage and leverage funding uh, to address the critical problems that you all see eye to eye need to be addressed. Just last Friday, actually, I was in Manila uh, talking to the Asian Development Bank about this, this, this exact issue. We're investing billions of dollars in the energy sector uh, in Afghanistan. By the way, they're investing billions of dollars in the energy sector in Afghanistan. What a novel thought. Let's get together, sign a memorandum of understanding, and see if we can leverage some of, this, some of these resources and not use as many in that one particular area, maybe move, use some in another area. So you know, we've got to get away from this us versus them. And it's all about the taxpayer's money. We've got to manage it better. And I think it makes for better coordination and policy. Uh, and I think a lot of our donors now, or a lot of the multilateral institutions, excuse me, are starting to recognize that as well as with the donors. And it's all about credit. It comes to national interest. And I think some of these institutions are finally saying, enough of the credit. We'll figure that out later. Let's figure out how to uh, manage the resources. What's your second question? The second question is, within the Biden assistance, how do you see the global realities taking hold on the USA? Uh, I take it as an example, let's say China is being pushed into Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, you see a little bit more competition coming from non traditional partners. Yeah. Uh, and You're talking about the BRICS? Yes. Okay. yes. And, and I think moving forward in the next 10, 15 years, uh, the, the soft power that you've spoken about is not going to be as as easy as, as what we can uh, expect yeah. in, in the next 15 years. You're absolutely right. Um, we are moving into a phase, uh, and you, you're aptly pointed out China. Uh, they are going to be a major player, uh, not only in Africa, but throughout the world. Uh, they are an economic giant. Uh, but I think we can't stand in the tallest building and scream about the ineffectiveness of China. We have to work with them to get them to understand what works, what doesn't work, and the effects of some of the things that they're doing in these countries. But in the end, let's not be uh, Pollyanna about this. They are going to do, as we've done in our, in our past, what's in their national interest. That's what we're talking about, national interest. So we will continue to coordinate with, with the rest of the BRIC countries and, and try to get them to understand and coordinate better on some of the things that they're doing in these countries. But it's going to be about dialogue. You're not going to stop them from doing what they're doing. OK, I got to go back over here again. Nothing over here? OK. Yes, sir. So my question is more in terms of implementation. Um, what happens if USAID is in a country that is economically improving, but your people on the ground see that the human rights situation is not what you would like? I mean, how do you balance that conflict in terms of it being an economic catalyst, but everyone in the region going, yeah. how come they can still do what they do? 
We're all young adults here, right? You guys are all going to be out in the real world. And yes, there are right and there is wrong. But uh, as people who will tell you who've worked in government, uh, who understand uh, Dr. Frazier, Jendai Frazier will tell you as well, everything that looks like it's the right thing to do on the 6 o'clock news is not that easy. Um, there, it goes back to that issue I mentioned earlier. It's about national interests. What, from a human rights perspective, we all believe, and it's part of what we, our DNA in the United States of America, it's not so easy to go tell that person in country X that you are doing Y, A, B, and C on human rights and we don't like it. Because we may need that guy in country X or that woman in country X to help us with a potential nuclear problem over here or another problem over here that they have influence on and by offending him, we can't get this done. Okay? So we, I think this is part, and this is my own humble opinion, that we are going to have to understand that in the future, and this gentleman talked about it quite eloquently, that there are a lot more influences on our foreign policy. We can't direct with the kind of influence that we've had over the last 20 years going forward. It's going to have to be much more collaboration and diplomatic uh, solutions to these problems and integrated discussions and coordination at the highest levels. I mean, uh, diplomacy is going to be so much port important in the future because, it, let's face it, we don't have the leverage that we once had uh, because there are m many more actors and players in the game. Just look at it. A few years ago, we were talking about the G8. What are we talking about now? The G20. Okay? And, and there are members of the GA who are unhappy about that because they love that closed club, you know? Now it's the G20. So there is more influence, more ex exogenous forces coming to grip on our foreign policy, and we're going to have to be multi-balanced uh, and, and multifaceted to be able to deal with those, with those issues and work collaboratively with these countries that are going to be asking for our, our support or asking us to work with them on some issues that they want to see uh, addressed. Yes, sir, I missed you last time, and I'll come to you, sir. Uh, I appreciate your call to me to us as convenes and citizens and especially to our students. Uh, I have a particular question. I have a friend who did apply for a for uh, He was a solid guy, uh, applied to be an engineering officer, worked for the Peace Corps, did uh, water from water work uh, in the Dominican Republic. He received a preliminary offer last April. He started his security clearance work last December, and he started applying over a year ago. Now, what am I going to tell my friend and, and my students about the hiring process that they have? It's a great question, and I never said it was going to be easy, did I? I never said that. But that's no excuse. As a graduate student who has bills uh, and responsibilities, the last thing you want to hear is that the job that you've always worn is going to take you a year. But let's be honest. Because you're going to be working at the highest levels of security in the United States government, especially you young folks who love to travel, and some of you guys go to places you shouldn't be going to, like Cuba and others, uh, those things have to be checked out. So all those extensive excursions you go on throughout Europe, at the end of the day, come back to bite you a little bit. And oh, by the way, they're doing security clearances for the rest of the US government as well. So the security clearance is usually about four, three to four months if you have not traveled extensively. If you have traveled extensively, you might as well put your bags down because security is going to be very, very meticulous about checking your background. So that could take six to eight months. The, the medical clearance, if you don't have major problems, because think about it, the government's hiring you for life, pretty much. I hate to say that, it's full employment. So they want to make sure that they, have, they run a pretty tight net. And we're, we've been working on with the new classes coming in of condensing that down. But security is not having it. If you've been, if you're someone who's traveled extensively, be prepared for a long wait. If you haven't, you you you, you could end up on board within six months. That's that's about as quick, that's about as quick as they can turn it around. I'm not going to stand here and tell you we're going to have you in, in 90 days. That ain't going to happen. Six months is about the fastest I've seen it happen. I'd be happy. I, I, I'll take a look at it when I get back, and I'll send you an email personally and tell you exactly what happened. But if he's traveled extensively. You're at the Bay of Security. I mean, you're at the, the health, uh, at the behest of the Security Department. Okay. Uh, back over here. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious, um, in terms of when you guys find success, to go into the country and say you're successful, what are the indicators that you use to determine that? 
Well, I, I, I really can't stand here and tell you that we have been successful uh, because it's, it's a bigger question. You know, development is hard. If we were easy, everybody would be doing it. Uh, and I love, you know, Sean Penn and all of these guys who are running to uh, countries and providing assistance. But that's not development. Uh, and development is a, a continuum. There are a lot of things that have to happen to get that country to where we're talking about from a development perspective. And by providing assistance or emergency assistance, that's, that doesn't get them there. Uh, I think that when you look, we'd love to see more Ghanas. I won't talk about Eastern Europe. When we, we declared success in Eastern Europe and Budapest and, uh, uh, and a few of those countries because we did what we needed to do and we were able to get out. Uh, in Africa, it's a little more difficult uh, because of the lack of precious metals uh, or oil. Uh, you have a much more difficult problem putting those structures in place. But I think what you're going to see over the next few years uh, as we lay out this new paradigm and we start to really prioritize that we can't be all things to all people all the time every day. And I think we're going to have to prioritize our assets and put them in a, a context of what our national interest is. And that's why this strategy that's being laid out, which has been talked about, uh, Dr. Frazier and others were talking about this in the last administration as well. We've got to have a strategy. There's too many people. If any of you all have read Security by Other Means, Lael Brainerd, it's a book. There's a chart in there, and it has like 50 different strands of everybody that's involved in foreign aid. It's confusing. It's utterly confusing. Well, today, they're going to talk about, A, a strategy for the US government, and then a process by identifying who's going to be responsible for doing what. Yeah, it took us to 2010 to get it done, but we're moving in the right direction. So to answer your question, I think we're going to have a better way forward in identifying what success is and what it's not, and also picking countries that we can actually get things done in uh, and move those countries along the development continuum. Last question, oh man. All right, I'll tell you what, since I don't want to make a tough decision, what's my favorite number? And it's between one and five, somebody tell me. Four, three, one, zero, three. She said Two. one through five, and someone said zero. It's five! <laughs> I'll, I'll give one of the, one of the, uh, one of the instructors, uh, one of the uh, professors. Professor, on the first row here, do you have a question? Question, no, question? Pass Doctor? No, pass. The, the professors are pass passing. The Did I let you guys pass in class? <laughs> All right. All right. First hand up. Yes, sir. In the back. Execution and accountability. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Thanks. I have a friend who worked for a while for a large USAID contractor in Afghanistan. Oh, we're hitting close to home. What year was it? Oh, okay. It's not my, I'm not on my watch. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's a not on my watch. Okay. All right. Go ahead. working on developing civil society. Right. Because they basically saw that the organization, its goals were just to keep the U.S. AFD on its own. And it was essentially about the slaughtering of hundreds of millions of dollars. So just doing nothing. Here's the question. Here's the question. Here's the question. And U.S. AFD wasn't particularly um, I, I told him that you were coming to give a talk and asked him sort of what kind of question you'd ask. Uh -huh. And he was interested in how you might comment on how USAID sort of manages its projects with everything being subcontracted out to large companies whose goals are not the same as USAID's and don't have the centers to perform. Can I turn the microphone off? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, look. If, I know most of you guys watch the news and you have an opportunity to, to see the sound bites about what's actually working and not working in, Af in Afghanistan. As I told the previous class that I spoke to before I arrived here, there is nothing more dangerous than a civilian trying to do reconstruction in the middle of an active insurgency. You understand what I'm saying to you? An active insurgency, okay? And the monitoring and evaluation that all of us pride ourselves on 
sometimes doesn't get done at the level we'd like to see it get done. But there's also other objectives that we're trying to reach in regards to stemming the tide of people going over to the Taliban or going over to more drug interdiction, I mean, going over to more drug trafficking. Doesn't allow for us, this doesn't allow for us to do things that are illegal. If your friend actually witnessed that, then he's part and parcel of the problem because there's a number. We live in a democracy here in the United States. There's a, an office called the Inspector General. He can call in on an anonymous phone call. He can send a note anonymously in the mail, and people will investigate that. The whole year I was there in Afghanistan, I had concurrent audits on every program that I worked in. And I'm not disputing your friend. There probably is some corruption going on in those programs. But at some point, and I, it drives me crazy when people get up and go, taxpayers' dollars are being wasted. Nobody's doing it intentionally. It, but it's either your life or you try to get something going in a particular community and hope that it takes traction. And if we find out something is illegal is being done, then we have to shut it down. But for him to send that message through you, I think the question should have been back to him, well, what did you do to stop it? And is this still happening? I, I don't know. The, I'd be happy to take the information from you, and I'll, I'll pass it to the IG personally. But we, we, we don't condone or tolerate corruption. We don't. Not in our society. We don't. And especially with taxpayers' dollars. But I don't want people to think that folks are just kind of sitting around eating bonbons uh, in Kabul or outside of Kabul trying to implement these programs. This is hard stuff. I mean, every day you get on the road, you could be killed by a roadside bomb. And oh, by the way, you don't have those Kevlar vests and an M16 and a helmet on. You're out there in your skivvies and your tied suit. Just what I have on now. I went to the minister's office. I went to opening clinics and schools with just what I have on now. Of course, when I get out of the car, they may put on a Kevlar vest. But in essence, I'm not a soldier. But I'm trying to implement US policy. And those are the chances that I took as a civilian because I believed in the policy and I think it's important to our national interest. But everybody gets up in arms about corruption. Yeah, we got corruption in our own country. But nobody's going to sit around and just let it happen. They shouldn't. And if they are, they're being negligent, and they should be reported. So you tell your friend I said that, and he, and he can write me if he likes. OK? Listen, thank you all very, very much for everything you do. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you all in USAID.